I brought Big Brother to Nigeria. So I'm the first producer of Big Brother Nigeria, but I don't own it, unfortunately. So I don't make money from it. But when I produced it for Mnet, they didn't have the capacity to produce it. Uh, I've always wondered why more Nigerians not adopting EVs. The reason is petrol is too cheap. Petrol was too cheap. Was too cheap. It's still too cheap because petrol is over 900 naira a liter in Ghana. But I'm actually saying it from a position of love. At that studios, we came with the approach that we're not just building game just because we wanted to build game. You play Call of Duty. It was made miles away. So what is the reason why your own game cannot be played by someone else in another continent? So These cars are not expensive cars. This car is cheaper than a, a new Toyota Corolla. There is an oil lubricant in this car will change it once in 10 years. So I will say this, if you look here, countless people, almost everybody here has, they have a dream. They want to succeed, they want to build the next Facebook, the next Google and all that. What are their chances from your own experience? Uh... There's actually something that's always, that's always bothered me about this hype about technology in Nigeria. And it's this, it's the fact that everybody is being pushed into getting tech jobs. You're hearing do ALX, do programming, do Flutter, do PHP, do HTML. And there are thousands of people, thousands of people in Nigeria right now, young people in university and graduating, who are actually training to go into tech. In fact, don't even take my word for it, just, just take a look. There are like 20,000 people there. 20,000 Nigerians who want to get into technology. And I just have to ask myself, is, are there enough jobs in technology in Nigeria for these people? That's the question we want to ask at the Art of Technology League. Uh, Dr. Junior Tehiwan, I am the founder of Beyond Limits and uh, immediate past director of Google West Africa. Oh, this event is great. It's so well attended. And, you know, creativity is part of our natural heritage as Nigerians and Africans. And technology is doing a lot in really fueling the creative industry. So bringing the two together in a conference is so important. And it's great just listening to the various conversations around how can we increase the contribution of the creative economy to GDP. You host, somehow you host uh, almost all the, you host almost all the shows on TV. I don't host them, but I produce you many of them. You host them, but you might need to go and fish on. Go and fish on. You always tell me to go. And you don't have what it takes to cut it and do this. There's a question I, I want to get from you. And people very rarely, people are uncomfortable answering the question. And if you don't want, if you don't have, if you don't want to answer, I will understand. Where was the jump for you? Because yeah. to go from, yes, to go from, um, you're selling, you're selling, you're, to go from feeling like nightclubs, all right, and then moving into CDs that were not selling, and then to becoming the producer in which almost every single production you are in it. Where was that jump? What was oh, the... I think I think I would say, I brought Big Brother to Nigeria. So I'm the first producer of Big Brother Nigeria. So that's the biggest show in this country. But I don't own it, unfortunately. So I don't make money from it every year when Multi-Choice is doing it. Why didn't you own it? Because you can't own it. It's not as simple as saying, when you ask why didn't you own it, because you didn't understand the business model. So Big Brother, like every other franchise, is owned by a television production company. A television production company licenses the franchise into different markets. So let's say the annual license for Big Brother is 250,000 pounds, right? So Mnet paid for it for 10 years, 2.5 million. They have the exclusive right to produce it. We produced it for Mnet. Do you understand? So Mnet now produces it for themselves. That's the difference, okay? When I produced it for Mnet, they didn't have the capacity to produce it. We produced it with Endemol, who own it. Right, so we co-produced it in Nigeria first time. Now Mnet has Mnet Local built, Productions. Built, built, they built capacity. capacity. All those guys used to work for me. Of course, that's that's, <laughs> that's like that's, that's like, the game. That's like a Machiavellian move. Well, it is. It is because media is media is not a simple thing. Everybody thinks it's like at that time everybody say, "Ah, I'm making so much money from voting." I said, "No, I'm not. Mnet owns the voting." Do you understand? We don't make money from it. 
I might produce the show. Same thing on Idols, any of these shows. The broadcaster owns the rights in this market. But there are markets in which I would own the rights. If I was doing, the, if I was doing the Idol in America, I could own the rights because the market is different. The broadcast market is different. In Nigeria, the broadcast market is still, they buy out, they own everything. So they're not licensing the thing, except it's my original format, like Niger Sings, which we created. The other side. But yes, we've done a lot of that. But it's not to do the jump. I don't know about a jump. Wow. I think it came from good luck, good timing, and perseverance. That's that sounds like an additional speech. Well, it's, it's the truth. Though. But I'm not good at hearing no. So if you tell me no a hundred times, I'll come a hundred and one. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Organize this. And now you can see like this is like kind of entry that they are making into the sports arena. Um, of course, we've seen how they have been used to make or capture almost impossible um, scenes and pictures from heights and from difficult terrain. The players don't engage themselves. However, they engage the drones. So you see the drones ramping each other. My name is Phoenix from Dafo Media Africa. Can you tell us? My name is John from Dacidus. All right. Can you tell me what made you go into gaming in Africa, knowing fully well that it's saturated with a lot of games from abroad? All right. So uh, at, at Dust Studios, we are focused on creating not just any game, but a world-class game that can compete with games in the West. Now, what we have been missing from the space is that, yes, we have tons of games here, but which of those games can compete with the best games that comes from the West? For example, I'll give you a perfect example. Say we have an endless runner, just running, just runner games. You know that your absolute competition is Subway, a Subway Surfers. Would you build a game that can compete with Subway Surfers or would you just build any game and expect to succeed? The consumers will always choose the best all the time. So, at that studios, we came with the approach that we're not just building games just because we wanted to build games. We wanted to build games that everyone around the world can enjoy and that can compete in the genre that we're in with any other alternative in the market. Right. And so we just released our debut game, Nouns Hunt. Um, Nouns Hunt is an, an, an adaptation on the game that I'm sure you've played. Uh, name, Animal, yeah, Place, and Thing, A to Z game, whatever you called it when you were growing up, the paper yeah, game. Yeah. We gamified that experience and with over 2,000 players in over 25 countries now around the world in Open Better, uh, we, are, we are going out to achieve what we set. In the Nigerian market right now, there are games that are more like first-person shooter games that what captures the audience. Do you have any plans to dive into that aspect or will you still be based more on the Nigerian aspect of gaming? No, we intend to make so many games, not just for mobile but for PC. It's not just about creating games, but creating games that the market needs. So if there is a demand in the market for the specific type of game that you just mentioned, yes. we will. Okay, first of all, we're not selling for the African market. Our game is all around the world. We don't think that games should be limited to a specific and demographic. We believe you play Call of Duty. It was made miles away in a different continent. So what is the reason why your own game cannot be played by someone else in another continent? So I don't believe in limiting your creative product to small continents. We believe in distribution and getting the genre that you need. Nouns Hunt is in the world game in general. We have to admit it's not as big as the first person shooter genre, of course, but there is still a market for world games. Was, this car was assembled in Nigeria. No. So this car was actually assembled in Ghana. So we have assembly plants that we intend using. That we're using. So it's not. But for this that you're seeing actually, it's assembled in Ghana. Very soon, everything you're looking for, any part you're looking for, you can actually get them there. But the assembly plants, from my knowledge, it's almost completed. Well, where you, you are assembling electric vehicles currently in Ghana and that you are building a plant in the cruise. We are assembling the assembly plant in Ghana is still under construction. Construction. 
This one is still under construction too, but this will open first, although we started operations in Ghana first. How do you get into the tech space? Let's first start that. Space. Well, I'm actually a medical doctor. I graduated from the University of Illinois in uh, 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 1991. Oh my God. But, uh, but um, I, uh, I had the hardest time deciding between medicine and engineering in getting to the university, I chose medicine. I don't you understand me, honestly. No, go ahead. Okay, because I'm also a doctor. Oh, you're yeah, a doctor? Ah, yes. Very good. So, that's the reason why. What about you? So, you did, you built, can you, can you tell us what the journey looked like? Okay, so, so the journey is, is that I've always been involved, interested in tech, but I've always been involved, interested in tech, so I started getting more and more in, involved in informatics. So, I did that, I practiced, but when I started practicing, I started doing I have a telemedicine program that I started, started getting in informatics, and then I have been interested in renewables. And I have been driving electric cars since 2013. I bought one of the first Teslas I ever had. So um, from there, I started investing in Tesla. I've always wondered why uh, more Nigerians not adopting EVs. It's been so confusing to me, but the reason is, Petrol is too cheap. Yes. Petrol was too cheap. Was too cheap. Wow. It's still too cheap because petrol is over 900 naira a liter in Ghana. You shouldn't so, allow Nigerians to hear you say that. Sir. I know. I'm saying that because because people, people feel that you are saying it from your privileged position. No, 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 no. no. I understand seriously. that. Seriously. And, and I understand that. But I'm actually saying it from a position of love and understanding. Why doesn't Ghana and all the other countries? Why don't they have a poor subsidy? So they are putting this money that goes to poor subsidy. Falsely, you know, there's a lot of fraud surrounding the poor subsidy. But some, sir, some people may feel that you are saying that uh, because you're manufacturing EVs. Um, actually, that is not that is not true at all. Whether you like it, the truth is still the truth. Because I'm saying that from the aspect of we are here to actually save people money. Because the true cost of petrol is not 190 a liter. The true cost of petrol is over 850. And we are still buying it for 600. So what I'm saying is, well, if as a country, we have been strategizing on how to go to EV, UCNG to produce power, UCNG to do a lot of other things. We will not be in this situation. People would have had EVs. These cars are not expensive cars. This car is cheaper than a, a new Toyota Corolla. How much, how much, how much are you This is $18,500. That's $24,000. That's cheaper than a Toyota Corolla, I tell you. So my point is that when I'm saying these things, yes, it looks inflammatory, but it's the truth. Right now, the smallest Uber car, the Toyota Espresso, is 9,000 Naira a day to buy petrol for an Uber driver. And is this Naira a day for that little Toyota, uh, that little Suzuki? That's 15 liters. Yes, sir. 9,000 Naira a day. If you are an Uber driver, can you imagine that? Okay, a Toyota Corolla, Toyota Camry is almost 20,000 Naira. And the older the car, the more petrol is chopping. A large ride driver is 17,000 Naira. Okay, this car, the charge it four hours, is 300 kilometers. We've been collecting data for a year. None of the Uber drivers are going to drive more than 200 kilometers a day. What is the fuel charge at 125? So these cars are half or less of the maintenance cost of an internal combustion vehicle. Now, by the way, would you agree with me that at least 50% of the population of Nigeria has access to electricity for 12 to 20 hours a week? So 50%. So you're making a case for it that most people, if they buy this from you, they will be able to charge the batteries. That's what you're saying, sir. But sir, I, I want to start. Okay, so. So, so one more thing okay. before I, one more thing. The truth is that 50% of the population of Nigeria are potentially customers of an electric vehicle. But can they afford to make an almost 20 million deposit on the electric vehicle? 
not no, everybody, no, but not a everybody. lot more than you think. So here's the so ninety six percent of Nigerians eh? well, according to a study done in twenty nineteen do not have half a million in their accounts. That is true. And that is why I call this a financing problem. So if a bank is able to finance a regular internal combustion, I'll just call them ICE over three years. They can finance this over six to seven years because they last longer. They don't break down. The cost of ownership is much less. So now you can understand that in some ways, these cars can be more affordable. Okay, we have vehicles that are comparable to a Prado, even cheaper, and they are fully electric, and you will never need to buy gas, and you will charge it at home. So, I'm home because I love this country. This country educated me free, and I'm very proud that I'm able to come back after I ran away like Andrew to contribute something. I, I think we should actually we should commend you for what you've done, being able to take your education, um, leverage your education into, um, into raising the capital, the kind of capital and knowledge needed to go into this kind of industry. What's the meaning of Saglev? Oh, all right. So Saglev is actually the, the first, uh, the, the last names of the pioneers in battery electric technology. Okay. Stamberg. Anderson, Geisner, Levanche, Edison, Volta, Saglev. All right, so, so thank you very much for that. So I'm Dr. Olubenga Samuel Falae, and this is my technology story. Beautiful. I am Caesar Keliro. I run Nanocentric Technologies, a tech advisory firm this is my technology story. So let's so let's get to hear what you do. What what you do? What's it like? What's the, what's the outlook like generally? What's your industry like? What what are the performances that are expected of you? I work with um, African Financial Federation. I, I play the role of um, the head of VCs. I had to take out my time to run through certain meetings, all scheduled for the whole day, and connect with startups, know their their unique offers, and why they need funding. And it's it was quite, a, quite an interesting experience trying to understand how technology is evolving. We believe that uh, beyond just funding, we have a whole lot of things that um, you can provide mentorship, guidance, uh, market connections, or, or market access to ride into certain markets, which uh, makes it easy for startups. So I will say this if you look here, there are countless people, almost everybody here has probably they have a dream, they want to. They want to succeed, they want to build the next Facebook, the next Google and all that. What are their chances? Um, I've always believed that if you... There's a whole lot that goes into building, into creating. If you have the drive, you have the product built out, and you are ready to go for the long haul. Because the challenge about success, we always... Because of the way it's, um, it's captured in the media, because you need to make sure that uh, there's a bit of drama and all the stuff to it, and um, excitement to it. But the truth is, everybody here stands a very good chance, in spite of the difficulties in our market. What particular kind of industries are you guys looking into? Uh, we're looking at media itself. We're looking at media. We're looking at um, one of the critical sectors we're looking at is um, artificial intelligence itself. Artificial intelligence, do you mean that startups that are coding artificial intelligence or startups that are using? Massive uh, pool of data to extract insights that can drive. Any interesting projects you're working on? Project? So, up to build capacity around investing in startups and um, to. Um, most especially to 